I'm also going to thank the organizers, which sounds very weird considering uh, my relationship here. But uh, it's true in that anyone who knows me knows I'm not this organized. Um, so many hats off to Doug Kennedy and the, and the Cordigen team here. Um, we are going to be speaking a little bit about um, decentralization and uh, what the cannabis industry is going through. Because when you look at this from a historical context and you look at other industries, when this happens, you do see real renaissance occur. Uh, we're not all the way there yet, as you've seen from many of the speakers today. Uh, there still is centralized control over the cannabis industry, and it, it leads to one-size-fits-all thinking, which um, can be detrimental to much of the marketplace. But we're halfway there. We're partially decentralized with the laboratory of democracy here, where many different states and countries are experimenting. And this experimentation is incredibly healthy. Uh, we hopefully will eventually get to complete permissionless innovation, which will happen if it's a fully decentralized environment. Uh, but I don't think we're there. I think we still need some tools to accelerate this. We need catalysts to get us there. And when you look at other industries that have gone through this, uh, those catalysts sometimes actually require some order from chaos, as my brother just brought up. Um, so let's take some historical examples that are perhaps overused and a little bit trite. Uh, you look, there's no technology presentation you can do without talking about the printing press, so here we are. Um, Gutenberg's printing press, uh, it wasn't really the first book that, that was printed off it that mattered, it was the fact that anybody could print it. Uh, and we've seen this also with the internet. Uh, we have a very vibrant debate now over what's fake news and what's real news. And I actually think that's fantastic because now people are actually looking for references. And we actually have science, the scientific method inside of the, the news agencies, hopefully. Uh, and it gets people to think for their own. This is, this is very, very helpful. Uh, we're seeing it in the financial industries with Bitcoin. This is a centralized banking crisis that we have that's all over the globe right now. And now there's cryptography and peer-to-peer -peer networks that can do this a different way. We have a $30 billion economy that's booming out of this thing. Uh, and it's going to play a role in all types of informatic databases in the future. Um, and of course now, we are in a world where uh, we can sequence genomes out of things that fit in our pocket. Um, I was actually afraid to tell you about this and fear that this whole audience would clear out of here and go look at it. But Yvonne has just set up a DNA sequencer out there in the hallway and it's sequencing a cannabis genome as we speak. Uh, so go have a look at that when this is over. But this is going to mean that you can decentralize sequencing. You no longer need million dollar laboratories with licenses to sequence. We're going to see people do it in Africa. We're going to see people do it in Afghanistan. Uh, and that's going to change uh, fundamentally how we approach science because many more questions can be asked about the code of life as opposed to having somebody demand to you what it is by uh, some written book. Uh, this is what's going to happen in the next few years. It's already happening. We have million dollar sequencers you may have seen up at the tours at Cortigen. They're turning into these things in the next few years. We have PCR equipment that's probably $20,000 to get your hands on, and it's turning into USB-based uh, PCR devices you can see out on, on the tables out there. Um, so when this happens, much more innovation is going to come to the table because many more minds can access this, and many more minds means much more innovation. Uh, so to make this innovation happen, we do need a little bit of a nomenclature system. If you look at the internet, it runs off of TCP IP. If you look at Bitcoin, it actually has everybody agreeing on a consensus and everybody running the same code. And Gutenberg probably had a font size that mattered. These things help us communicate when we want to decentralize. Um, so I'm going to go through a couple examples of this here. Uh, we, we sequence things a variety of different ways at, at, uh, at medicinal genomics and Cortigen. There's whole genome sequencing where you sequence the whole 800 megabase genome. We've, we put a couple dozen of those public. Uh, we have some uh, StrainSeq version 1, which we did many years ago, where we were sequencing 3 million bases out of the plant. And you get about 100,000 variants from that. Uh, StrainSeq version 2 is what we're doing mostly today. There's 850,000 bases sequenced for that. And that gives us a nice 10,000 uh, variants or so. Uh, we've put 420 of those public just this week. Uh, many of them have been partially public through Canopedia. We got them a little bit more organized recently. And I'm going to touch on one that's a little bit smaller than this, a $450,000 450, uh, base pair panel that we use to try and build a Rosetta Stone for all the public data that's out there so we can look at data in the same way. And then there are SNP genotyping tools we're going to touch on as well, where you can just genotype a couple SNPs to really understand what's going on uh, with your plant. So this is a phylogenetic tree now that's up on Canopedia. Uh, it's actually an interactive one. I don't think I have time to bounce to it on the, on the website here. But if you scroll around in this, these samples will light up based on their proximity to each other. When I say proximity, I mean their genomic proximity. So there is a scale in there that's a Roigi biv scale, red, orange, uh, yellow, blue, green, that tries to designate if something's within a clone distance of one another, a sibling distance of one another, or a distant cousin, and so on. And so you can see from uh, maps like this, you can quickly select a set that are closely related. And we also happen to have hundreds of these things terpene and chemotype uh, assessed. 
So we can ask, do the ones that are very genetically similar, does it predict the chemotype of the plant? In the case of these ACDC canatonic lines, uh, they do. We see very consistent myrcene signatures out of these, pinene and bisabolo. Uh, we can also see this in a, in a terpinaline class of samples that are quite frequently found with the Jack Herrera class uh, and uh, the St. Jacks, and they come out with beta carotene and terpinaline. So the genetics are beginning to give us uh, a prediction tool for which terpenes might in fact be expressed. Um, and this can be very important if you want to understand nomenclature and labeling, right? So we did run around and sequence about 15 or 20 blue dreams from all over the country to figure out uh, what is this thing. Uh, and you'll see that lots of them actually cluster uh, right up here in red, but there are some over here and some over there and some over there, and we see some people have renamed them to Snoop Stream, and they're absolute clones of something else, um, and maybe they sell better, we don't know. Uh, but uh, that does go on, uh, and the question is, can you split this with something more than sequencing 450,000 bases, because that can be expensive. And we're going we're to touch on that in a bit. The other thing that's going on in this data set, it's not yet public, but we're working to move it there, is that we are sequencing the microbiomes of these. We've done about 400 microbiomes of the cannabis flowers, occasionally on the roots, and about 10% of those have actually been on samples that have been terpene profiled. And the reason for this is we know the microbes are playing a role in terpene metabolism. We know they're playing a role in terpene expression. If you look at this wonderful paper uh, that went about using antibiotics to fumigate the plants, they see the terpene expression changes if you actually fumigate them with antibiotics. Uh, now, this wasn't done in cannabis, but you can see the terpenes that are up there imply that it will probably happen in cannabis. These are very similar uh, terpenes, linalool, pinene, myrcene. So um, we're expecting a similar thing to occur. So we can't ignore the microbiome. The genetics are, of course, predictive, but it's the hand that you're dealt, not necessarily how you play it. Uh, and so we're keeping an eye on that. Now, switching gears a little bit here, when you have this much sequence density, if you sequence to you know, 450,000 bases or 850,000 bases inside of, a, uh, inside of a cannabis plant, you get enough markers throughout the genome to do what's known as genome-wide association studies. And you're just simply tracking the variants to see if they correlate with a particular trait, a quantitative trait loci, they call it. And when you do this, you start to get some signatures coming out. You need about 200 samples done, done that are profiled with your trait, and, and you have perhaps that are all terpene profiled and not terpene profiled. And when you do this, we're already starting to see some signature for SNPs that might predict terpenylene expression. Now, we need to expand this with more strains, because we didn't have a whole lot of terpenylene-rich strains in this data set. But uh, it's promising, because this is what we did with the Human Genome Project. It worked very well. So this leads us to uh, a Rosetta Stone panel that uh, we just recently cut, and we have we're a couple hundred samples deep into this. This is meant to uh, triangulate all the public data that's now public. We have many people contributing to cannabis genomics now, which is fantastic. We've got a data set from Nolan Kane's lab. He's going to speak about this. We've got John Page here who's going to speak about all the data they've done. We have Bylos out in Oregon who's doing a lot of great work. They've put 845 samples public as well. Uh, but the problem is we're all sequencing different regions of the genome. So it's very difficult to take our data and compare it to theirs and vice versa. And so we can't really build a nomenclature system until we can start to triangulate these things. So we decided to build a panel that would sequence hundreds of SNPs from everybody's data so that we can then triangulate any one sample to everyone else. Uh, and while we're at it, we figured we ought to sequence the genes uh, that everyone cares about, which are these cannabinoid and terpene genes uh, that, that the Van Bakel paper described back in 2011. So we have this panel running now, and we're beginning to sequence these uh, to, to, to refine uh, some of these maps. But I think what's going to distill from this is the capacity to take all of the SNPs that have the most discriminatory power and, and, and distill them into a barcode, if you will. And the reason we want this is that these terms indica and sativa, anyone who's done genomics will tell you they're meaningless. Uh, and people are putting these on labels and giving them to patients. Uh, so we have to change this. Uh, we don't mind those historical terms being thrown around, but we should bring in something that has a little bit more uh, digital signature to actually the fingerprints of these strains, and that may also tie to the chemotype by sequencing some of, some of those genes. So what we want to do is sort these SNPs that are quite potently uh, informative into an array that can then get distilled into a barcode label. And when we ask that question, we're beginning to zero in at around 30 SNPs, 29 SNPs, maybe 27. There's some debate as to how many exactly we need, but it's looking like it's a very small number that we can use to distill any one of those strains on that large map. And if that's the case, it changes the way you think about the technology and how decentralized you can get. So here's uh, a list of Blue Dream, and what you're going to see up here uh, on, uh, vertically are every Blue Dream sample and the different SNPs they have at the particular scaffold locations in the genome. And of course, you can see that all those red ones that are clones have very similar SNP patterns. And some of the ones that are sitting off in the other areas of the chart, like at 8 o'clock and 6.15 and 10.30, 
They're the ones that are way out here. So we can readily discern between clones, siblings, and things that are just mislabeled, which is 29 SNPs. Uh, and we think that's going to hold true throughout the rest of the tree. Which brings us to uh, uh, the second part of this talk, which is um, how do we make this go to the grow? Because there are state lines we have to honor. Uh, we can't move material. We can move DNA around. We can't move leaf matter around. Uh, and we want to get the, the grows to be actually be able to do this on site. So there's a lot of people that helped on this. Uh, that the reason I have, to have this Henry Ford um, thing up here is that this would not have happened without the help from New England Biolabs. It would not have helped, and help or happened without the help from Eichen Chemical in Japan. It would not have happened without Amplius and Mini PCR. There's one of those devices out there I recommend people see. And we did play around with some nanopores in the process as well. And we have one of those running um, on the desk out there. So what do we do? Well, let's use these $650 USB drives that can do PCR. Uh, these are now available. They're no longer uh, $20,000. Uh, they do not have a detector head on them, which is one reason why they're very cheap. They're light enough you can get them up to the space station. They're sending one up uh, in the next mission, I've heard. It may already be there. Um, and you can get them to the TSA. I've done that. Uh, they didn't have any issues with it. I didn't have to pour it out. Uh, so uh, it does, it's very portable and very light. Uh, but with this, it does eight wells of PCR. Uh, you, can ban you can gang up two of them under one laptop. The assay costs are still a little bit unknown. It's around $750. It should be cheaper than anything you put in the mail. And the ambiguity here is that we don't know the kit sizes people want yet. We're collecting a lot of feedback on that. It could, they could be big. They could be small. And uh, you'll see why that matters momentarily. Um, and the other detail here is that it works off of a hole punch, one hole punch from a leaf. And you can get genomic information off of it with a very quick prep that we have um, that can be showcased outside. Um, and you get answers in 90 minutes. Uh, so this is much faster than shipping it in the mail and waiting a day or two. Um, and the more important thing that, that, that our lawyers really addressed on this is that the reason we did this and the impetus we did this was that we had lawyers review whether we could put leaves in the mail or put Kaledin stamped onto paper in the mail. And all of them said no. They said you can put the DNA in the mail and you can put the hemp stalk in the mail if it's been sterilized. But you can't put the, anything that's photosynthetic onto paper and ship it in the mail. I don't make these rules. They do seem a little silly, but um, the fact is we would rather move the problem to the grow than move the problem to our database, where it will become a collection of people who have violated the CSA. Um, privacy is, in fact, an issue. Uh, for many people, there are cannabis patents emerging, and a lot of them speak to genetics. So this keeps it in your hands. Um, so this little device can then do, run tests, like for the BD allele. We did a lot of single molecule sequencing to figure out what SNPs are driving the BD allele. Um, there's some folks in this audience, Adrian, who actually helped uh, champion this stuff at, at Medicinal Genomics and many others at Medicinal Genomics. This um, tells you whether your plant is going to be a type 2 or type 3. It cannot discern between the homozygous or heterozygous state of a functional CBD allele, but it can tell you that your plant's got the potential to make CBD, and usually it's going to be a 50-50 or an all-CBD strain if, you're, if this thing turns yellow on you. So if it doesn't turn yellow, you are a THC-rich strain, then you'll be pink. And it'll, that's the blue dream in the AK-47 you can see up there. The other thing we can tell is male versus female from this. We have assays that target the Y chromosome, so you can get a color change if something's uh, male or female. Um, and there's a few other tests um, that we're working on, I'm going to touch on momentarily. If you want to scale this up, we're working toward cheap ways that will get this in 96 full format as well. Uh, these, there are some, thermal, some hot plates from, from Thermo that are around 400 bucks a piece that can get you going on this, but they don't have automatic timers on them, so they're not as, uh, you have to kind of control those yourself. So we did bring this out to the field to several beta trials, and we're very thankful. I think many of them are here. Uh, Connecticut Pharmaceuticals, the Slater Center, and Colorado Seeds helped us in this. And every one of those sites, we learned something and changed the primers accordingly. And I'll just give you what, on the most recent one that occurred, we went out to Colorado Seeds very recently and ran 47 known males and 47 known females. We could visually confirm they were male and female, uh, and we were able to get 100% accuracy off of that, that trial. We've expanded this since then, and the accuracy is probably more like 95% from what we're seeing when we go out to end numbers of 250, and it's very strain specific. There is another version of trying to sex sam uh, seeds, where you look at the size of the seed, and some folks think that they can determine sex from the size and the shape of the seed. Uh, we have a high discordance rate with that. We don't know what the answer is for those. Those plants are still not mature. But if we look at our concordance uh, compared to what we did with knowns, uh, we think the seed sizing probably is still a bit of a coin toss. Um, now, we also did this in the BD allele. We went and looked for the BD allele, which is the CBD producing gene, all over the country. We did many samples that Sonoma Labs helped us capture out of the Emerald Cup. 
we went to Colorado and looked at a hemp farm out there, and we were able to detect all of those, and we also looked at the ones in Massachusetts. We've not seen a fail yet on CBD. Uh, these are all the samples we've tested to date with it, so if your, if your genome is in there, uh, it's, this test likely works for it. We're always open to scan more. There's possibility that there is an unknown marker out there we've missed. Um, now, this can obviously extend to other regulatory concerns. Uh, we can go about and test any presence absence test that's a concern with the plant. Uh, so if you're thinking about aspergillus, if you're thinking about E. coli or salmonella, a lot of the, lot of the regulated labs have to test for these things. We, we're now in the process of converting those into yes-no colorimetric assays. These can be do, done both in third-party labs and done locally, which is probably how the, the industry should mature. Eventually, the manufacturers will begin testing before they ship to, to, uh, to labs. It's just the, the right thing to do. We have a um, uh, grant from NIDA as well to fund this to try and drive some of this technology into picking up the mycotoxins. That's going to require some immunopCR, and uh, there's a bit more to be spoken about that in, in, uh, in next year. So genomic scales very well. That's the one thing I want to touch on. There's plenty of time for it. Um, if anyone's been following this human genome curve, uh, that's Moore's law that's looking really flat and slow there. Uh, well, the, the genomics race has actually gone way past Moore's law on this. Uh, and this is going to apply to what we're doing in this space with this colorimetric assay. Can we scale this down such that these 25 microliter wells can quickly move into 96 well plates? But we've already done that. Uh, we've already moved them into 10 microliter wells into 3D4 well plates. So you can see these cost curves are very elastic. And we're playing around with this system that does 1536 uh, uh, wells, and these 1536 wells are two and a half microliters. This is not hard stuff. This is just repeating history. We did this before in 1996. These can go even down to six nanoliter wells if you really want to get microfluidics involved. Uh, I don't think we need that, uh, because when you think about the problem we're trying to address, if it's just 30 SNPs, we just need a log scale of reduction so that we can get an entire genotype of a plant point of grow on one of these assays. So you can imagine all you need is your camera to just take a picture of this and you can hit Canopedia and know what it is. And while you're at it, you should throw an aspergillus, powdery mildew, and a handful of other markers that you might want to get out of your grow. Which brings us to powdery mildew. Um, this is not what we thought it was. Uh, we went through the literature trying to make assays for everything in the literature that might be on the plant. Um, and so you'll see in the literature uh, L. torica, P. macularis, and golovinomyces. Uh, we thought it was that. We made assays for it. They all failed. It turns out it's a novel species that exists on cannabis. It's been painstaking to get the genome sequence of this. It's required a lot of special care to make sure we don't get other endophytes and epiphytes in the process of sequencing. But the thing to know is that this pest, which is probably the largest pest in the cannabis field, it, it, when it hits you, it hits you at the worst possible time at the end of your life cycle when you spend all that time growing the plants. Uh, and it can, it can whack out 50% of your grow, uh, this thing's vascularized in the plant. And so it, it can be there when you can't see it. Uh, and the DNA picks it up. Uh, and so we decided to make a hole punch assay that would actually target this genome so that we can then tar see if we can eradicate this from grows before it becomes a problem. Um, so we managed to scrape off some of that white, those spores off of the, off the leaves and shotgun sequence those. Uh, and then get ourselves a reference. Now, we've only done this in New England samples. There's a possibility that there's another species out there, out west, that we need to consider. This is, in fact, the case with wheat. Wheat has two different bloom areas that exist on it. Uh, but uh, cannabis, so far, this is the only data we have right now is pointing to this one strain. And so far, um, the numbers on doing this um, look pretty good. When we run around with all the collaborators we've had and look for the, the samples that are clean and look for the samples that aren't clean of it, we get different signals. The clean samples stay pink and the ones that have powdery mildew turn yellow. We've tried a few samples that were in question and went through and absolutely mutilated the samples to see if we just undersampled the clean ones and it was still there. And it turns out uh, the, uh, the hypersampling didn't show us a new result. So um, needless to say, we're still learning how frequently we have to sample this to pick this up because it is vascularized and we don't know if we'll get it one hole punch. But uh, at the moment right now, it seems like we are getting it with one hole punch. The question is, are we going to capture it when it's a clone? Or are we going to capture it at 10 weeks or somewhere in the middle? We don't know yet. We're, we're hoping to work with a lot of people in the field to do that. Um, so finally, um, we did begin looking at other ways to genotype, which is using these portable sequencers. Uh, and this is still a work in progress, but STRs are becoming quite popular in the field to use STRs to fingerprint um, some of these strains. And the reason people want to do STRs is that they run in capillary electrophoresis, and they're really cheap to run. They can be under a dollar to run per STR, but capillary electrophoresis is a $50,000 instrument that's not field portable. So we want to take that technology and move it to these field portable sequencers um, so, because one day these field portable sequencers are projecting to be as small as a little chip that goes into an iPhone. It's not here yet, 
But if it happens, that could be a very handy STR tool for field-based genotyping, and we would want to integrate that into the Canopedia database if we have to. The preliminary data on this looks like um, there is still a little bit of work to be done, but it's going to work. Uh, these are STRs done out of cannabis on nanopores, and what you're seeing in a lot of these is, um, eh, let me go back to that, I missed it. Laser, what you're seeing here, that there is the, is the STR, which is a, it's a tandem repeat. And you'll see the tandem repeats, their differences, because they're supposed to be. These are, in fact, the, the, the variations we're looking for. The other thing you'll notice is a couple of the bases are, have error rates, and that's not actually unknown, or not uncommon with these nanopore sequencers. They're still at about 90% accuracy. A lot of depth of coverage might correct a lot of that. They're getting better. So I would say that the, the verdict on this is still out. Stay tuned, but these are probably going to play a role in doing pathogen detection or other types of fingerprinting in the future. So to summarize, I am on red. Um, we think under 30 SNPs can actually genotype samples. We believe we're going to be able to put this point of grow. We're out looking for funding to expand this genotyping technology so we can build the right microfluidic chips. They'll be able to do this very cheaply on site, and we can hopefully include a variety of other markers that would be of interest. And you see that marker list is growing. That marker list, we have male, female, we have CBD, we have powdery mildew. We're looking into terpene markers and, we're, and, we're, and likewise all the microbial risk. But we really want to open it up to the community as to what do you want to look for. Because the capacity to do genome-wide association studies means we could do with probably two or 300 samples, we may be able to find markers for powdery mildew resistance or drought resistance or name your QTL or your phenotype several hundred samples sequenced in one condition or the other, we can hopefully distill a SNP that can make it to a point of growth system that you'll be measuring on your phone. Uh, so with that, I want to thank everyone who made this happen, which was a very large group of people, including people outside of, of Cortigen and, and medicinal genomics. Uh, it was a, quite a fun era. I'm the lucky uh, recipient to brag about it up here, but it's really not my work, it's others. Thank you.